Welcome everybody to a new week of uh, Information Retrieval. So what's on the menu today? We are going to continue compressing uh, the index. That's pretty much all we are going to do actually uh, today. Compressing integers, compressing numbers. Uh, this is what's going to, uh, to keep us uh, busy. Uh, before I go through, uh, through uh, all the material uh, before the Easter break, I would like to take the opportunity to answer any question on the material of the previous week, because I know that uh, uh, there was a, a lot to digest. So do you have anything that is unclear uh, in uh, what we've been doing in constructing indices? Right, so it doesn't seem that there is any questions. Do not hesitate also to ask them uh, uh, offline or on Mattermost. Uh, you know, we are available even outside of the of the teaching hours, and uh, we we'll gladly uh, uh, answer any questions, the TI team and uh, and uh, myself. Um, all right, then if there are no questions regarding index construction, let's focus all our efforts today on index compression. So, what do we want to compress? This is what we want to compress. This huge thing right there. Because we saw this is the standard inverted index. This is what we built out of the collection. And this is what we use in order to answer the queries. How do we use it? Well, this is what we've already seen right, in the past few weeks. But we saw that there can be millions or billions of documents in the original collection, and there can be a lot of terms. In fact, we, 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 you can easily have half a million or a million terms, which is quite high right there if you have a million of them. And then you can also have huge uh, lists of numbers right there. As you know, it takes space. And uh, the more space it takes, first, it's harder to build. Uh, we've seen last week uh, how you build an index that is very large. We looked at DSBI, SPME, MapReduce, and so on, all of these ways. Uh, so the more space it takes, the harder it is. And secondly, uh, the more space it is, the less it fits in memory and the slower it's going to be to answer the queries because then you have to read more from disk and there is less in memory. So these are two reasons uh, why we want to compress the index because if we, if we can squeeze the same information, of course, we don't want to lose information, but if, when, if we manage to squeeze that into less space, uh, everything will just get faster, cheaper, uh, uh, and, and so on, right, in the, in the cloud. You will, need, you will need less machines in order to do all of that. Okay, so that's the motivation for what we uh, are going to be doing. Uh, there will be two phases in what we are going to do, right? It's going to be method, methodical. First, we are going to compress this, and then we are going to compress that, right? So first, the, the uh, dictionary, so the terms, and second, we are going to compress the, well, not really like that, more like that, right? We are going to squeeze the, the posting this like that. Right. But before we did it, we looked into statistics and I gave you two laws, Hipp's law and Zipp's law. So Hipp's law is the first law. What does it tell us? Well, it tells us that uh, if you index a lot of documents and more and more and more and more and more, and more documents, meaning also more and more and more tokens, um, you keep indexing, 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 and then you look at the size of the terms. Right. So what do we mean here? It's basically this size that we do. So if we keep adding uh, documents and document, how does that grow? And it turns out that Hipp's law tells us in the square root of the number of documents or tokens. Why do I keep saying documents or tokens? I don't care because in practice, the size of a document kind of can be considered a constant number of tokens. So it doesn't really matter if I use the number of tokens or the number of documents, right? But basically, the more collection, the more the collection grows, uh, the more in the square root of that, the number of terms is increasing. In particular, there is no maximum reach at any point. It just keeps growing and growing and growing. Every time you quadruple the size of the collection, you double the number of terms. That's Hipp's law. The second law tells us how the frequency of the terms evolves uh, with the rarity of the terms. So these are the, the here the most frequent terms. So the stop words, V, is, B, R, all these words that are there all the time. And then you go the rarer and the rarer and the rarer. Uh, so here, the, these are really the very fancy and very rare words. And we look at how many times do we find them in the input collection. Turns out that this is some constant divided by the rec. Meaning that if we renormalize to one, the frequency of the first one, 
And the second one is going to be twice, uh, so, sorry, half the occurrence, then one third, one fourth, one fifth, one sixth, and so on. This is also the, uh, the, this law that is called Sieff's law. This is the, uh, the uh, frequency of occurrence uh, of, the, of the terms, all right? And then you might be wondering, okay, you might know from your theory that if you sum that all up, one plus one half plus one third plus one fourth and so on and so on, that's called the harmonic sequence. Does it converge or does it not converge? Does it go anywhere? Is, is, is there any convergence of that sequence? One plus one half plus one third plus one fourth. Does anybody know that? Okay, who thinks? Ah, yeah, I see an answer. Yes, on the chat. Well, in chat, we have no diverges, uh, doesn't converge, but in class we had, yes, converges to zero. Depends if it's a sum or sequence. Yeah, all right. So indeed you are correct. You're absolutely correct. Uh, the, uh, the sequence does not converge. If you keep summing and summing and summing and summing, it, it goes to infinity. So that's, that should a bit you know, disturb you, right? Because we are basically saying that this is the law against which the term evolves. And, and, and if we keep summing and summing and summing, it doesn't even converge. In, but again, this is an empirical law, right? It is just a law that we see in reality, but in reality, uh, collections are finite. Uh, so it's all good, right? Uh, all right, so this is just a, a, a remark, just like that uh, uh, on the fly. All right, uh, so Heap's law square root of the number of terms to grow, sorry, this part of the index. And then the frequency, to, so the size of that is one over the, uh, the rank. Okay, so now that we have these two laws, Heap's law and Sip's law, uh, let's try to compress things. Well, the first thing that I can tell you is we already covered compression techniques in the past. This is not new. We've already, for example, considered removing numbers, considered removing uh, uppercase in order to to, to merge terms together. This is what we call types. We consider removing stop words that gets rid of a, of a few of them. We consider using stemming. So all of these things, in fact, are have an effect on the size of the dictionary, because if you do all of that, that, that reduces the number of terms. So in fact, we've already been doing compression without being aware of it since the beginning of the, of the semester, right? As it turns out, you can even quantify that. And this is something that is done in the textbook of the lecture. Uh, if you remove the numbers that that remove two percent uh, of the uh, of, of of the dictionary, if you do case folding seventeen percent less, the same as stemming, stop words doesn't do anything. Why? Because if you have millions of terms and you just remove thirty, that doesn't really change much, right? So this is why the zero percent. And if you do all of that, you gain one third. That's already nice, right? It's already nice to gain one third of. Uh, of the of the sets, all right, but we can do better than that. Now, this is the number on the number of terms, right? So this is the the, the height of the of, of the index. What about the non-positional postings? Meaning that this would be the uh, the blue uh, the blue scale right there. So how many uh, non-positional postings would we would we would we get less if we compress? So if we remove numbers, that's eight percent less. Case folding minus three percent. Stop words thirty percent. That's a lot of them. Well, of course. The stop words are those that have the longest posting list. So obviously, if you remove these, then you remove these gigantic posting list, right? So this is also not surprising. And then the stemming is another stemming is another four percent. So overall, we get forty-two percent less. So let me summarize: thirty-three and forty-two. If I go back here, this is thirty-three of gain right there and forty-two percent of gain right here, right? So these are the two things we want to compress. Okay, but this is what we've been doing so far. Can we do more? Yes, uh, absolutely. Oh, I had this one more slide. This is then on the total number of tokens, right? The, po the, the, the positional postings this time. So you see these, these are just the, uh, the numbers. This is, this is then not something you can see on the index. This is what comes directly from the collection. It's basically the size, uh, the, 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 the size of the original tokens with their positions. All right, can still be useful if you consider the, uh, you know, the, uh, the positional index that also has the position, because then you would have the positional postings. Okay, anyway, let's start with this, okay? To, uh, to compress, let's start with the dictionary. All right, remember 
that the dictionary is for looking up stuff. We want to look up the terms. So in order to look them up, we saw that there is a structure. For example, we looked at the B plus three, that is a possible structure that allows us to uh, look up and navigate and uh, find uh, one of the terms. And then you have the pointers to the posting lists, which we don't really look at right now. All right. So generally, this is on disk, that part right there, and this is in memory. But the thing is, if you can compress and compress and compress and compress, then you can fit more in memory and less on disk. And with a bit of luck, you might even be able to squeeze that in memory if you manage to compress it enough, right? That's one of the benefits of that. But anyway, uh, generally, what that means is that we would like to fit that in memory completely, and it's fine if this is on disk, right? Okay, so first approach, very naive. Uh, like uh, your first implementation ever uh, of a system and so on, what could you do? Well, you could say, okay, let's take an array of characters, write a fixed length string, 20, for example, and let's just take 20 bytes, if we take ASCII to simplify, so 20 bytes right there, uh, in order to store each term, right? So 20 bytes here. Here we can assume, so I'm putting it right here, right? So 20 bytes constant size here, four bytes, if we assume 32 bits are enough, that basically goes all the way to four billion. That should be fine, right? Even though you, uh, I don't know if I already told you, but on YouTube, they actually broke their counter uh, once they used 32 bits for the number of views on a video. And then there was the Gangnam style video that actually uh, broke <laughs> the, the limit. So they had to implement long and 64 bit uh, uh, view uh, numbers just because of that. But anyway, this is the story. Let's stick for now to 32 bits. Uh, all right, so we, let's assume this is enough. Here I have pointers. Here also I'm generous. I'm assuming 32 bits. Uh, uh, that, that, that should be enough for the pointer. That again gives us 4 billion addresses. So, so let's assume that. So 24, 4. Uh, of course, there's a few drawbacks if we do that. First, what if a term is higher, takes more space than 20 bytes? then we have a problem that we need to solve. Either we just cut it, uh, or we have to find some, offset, some, some outsourcing way of storing it, right? So this is the first difficulty. And the second issue is, of course, that we are wasting a lot of space as well, right? But nevertheless, this is a naive way of implementing, and then you can add like 28 bytes, uh, you know, for all of them, all right? But there is a better way, as you can imagine, than, than doing this, uh, this very, very naive uh, uh, storage layer. And this other way is to use a, a string, a single string where we have all the terms one after the other, whatever, however long they are, right? So what do we need to make that work? Well, we still need to compute the, the frequency of the terms, still four bytes. We still need the pointers and so on. But here, what we need, we no longer need these 20 bytes, you know, for the terms. We need the exact length of the terms. And we need three bytes. This is just why the three bytes? Well, it's because we want to store here the uh, separation between the words somewhere to know where that stops. Why three bytes? Well, three, that's 24, 24 bits. That's roughly 16 million. 16 million terms is something I think is reasonable to assume for the purpose of our computation, right? So let, let's assume three byte pointer in there uh, that tell us where the words are actually going to stop. And, uh, and finally, of course, there's the length here itself, which in average, and this is something you can do if you actually look at real, a real world on, on a collection, on average, uh, you can have an average length of eight bytes uh, for a word. So it means that per word on average is going to be eight. So you see here, we have four, four, three, eight, and that's actually less than the 20 bytes we used to have, right? Three plus eight is now 11, less than 20. So you see, we gain space per term by doing that. Okay, can we gain even more space than that? Yes, we absolutely can. How can we do that? Well, we can, for example, only put a pointer like that every couple of terms. Let's call it K. Every two terms, every three terms, we, we just skip. Like here, I'm doing it every three terms. And I don't put a pointer all the time, just every three times. So now I have less bytes for the pointers, right? Because now I have K times less pointers. So every K terms. But I still need to know where the words end, right? So I need to pay a price for saving on these pointers. And the price I have to pay is that here I'm putting the length of the word to follow. So eight means there's eight letters, three CPU, four DATA, and so on. So now I need these numbers. So of course, I gain here on the pointers, and I need to pay on the other side by adding one more byte here. That's the length. Again, why one byte? 
one byte means I can go all the way to a length of 256, right? So 256 characters for a term is also safe, or let's say uh, reasonable to assume. So I add one byte right there to each word. So now the, it's eight, that is the average length, plus one gives me nine. And now I have three over K. And of course, if you, if you increase the size of K, then you, 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 know, you start noticing a difference because here you paid one, and here you can get more than one if you, if you pick K uh, large enough, right? Okay, but there is no free lunch because as you can imagine, when we had a pointer everywhere right there, it was, it was quite easy to find the terms, right? You know where they start, you know where they stop. But now, what problem do we have here? Well, you follow a pointer, but then you, know you need to traverse. So here, you're no longer in know of one because you have something to traverse right there, right? So you need to pay a price uh, when you actually query the data. So it means that we did squeeze, we did gain space, but in terms of time, we are going to be a bit slower. So it's a compromise to make between space and time. You can squeeze more at the cost of being a bit slower at runtime. And you can actually do an exercise with that by looking at the search steps. So here, if you don't have this uh, uh, saving on the pointers and you really have a pointer everywhere for every term, then you're more or less logarithmic because you do, you do a real binary search in there, right? So you have, in that case, one extra memory seek in that case, two extra memory seeks in that case. That's for the binary search going down the, um, the B plus three, right? I'm assuming here binary, right? With a B plus three, it's even more than two, but uh, just to illustrate that. But what happens if I save on the pointers? So now I no longer, I no longer put, uh, let me rewind, I no longer put a pointer everywhere, but I skip and I have to do this linear search. What happens there uh, in my reasoning? Well, now, so I, I did compute an average here for over all the worlds of 1.4, but now if I save the pointers, then it's no longer logarithmic. There is the logarithmic part, you know, all the way uh, to, 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 to the right pointer, but then I need to scan through the list of, of the terms between two pointers. And so if I do the same computation uh, in there, so in that case, it's two, here you would need even three memory six because that was the last term in the in uh, b, uh, before a pointer and here you see the average is a bit uh, higher than that right? note that these trees that i'm drawing right here on, on on these slides these are not actual data structures it's only for the reasoning when i'm reasoning on the time that it takes to uh, to do memory six that that's all that is right there the, the yellow trees okay but anyway i have an average here of 1.4 memory six and now i have an average of 1.7 memory six because I'm no longer logarithmic here. I, I am introducing some linearity right now, all right? So this is really not perfect, perfect, right? I'm paying a price uh, at, uh, at runtime to do that, right? But maybe you want to pay that price if you, if you don't mind being a bit slower and uh, squeezing more. But there is something more. You might notice that if you, have a, if you start having millions and millions and millions of terms, then you're going to have a lot of words in the dictionary. And you probably noticed in a dictionary when you read what is in there, that if you read in the order, in the alphabetical order, it's a lot like automata, automate, automatic, automaton, right? Keep repeating the same prefixes over and over again. Can we compress something here? Yes, absolutely. Your intuition should probably tell you that. You can indeed avoid repeating that, uh, you know, that part that is repeating all the time. And how do we do that? Like this. We just put the prefix just once. Of course, we adapt to whatever terms we have, but here we can say, okay, automat is common to this and the next words. And then I have the star that tells me, okay, that's the end of the prefix. Then I have automata, automate, automatic, automation, automation, right? So now I have just, I, I, I pick them, these symbols randomly. It doesn't matter what symbols you pick, right? But just symbols that are not used in the term. But now you see this is called front coding. You just use the fact that it's an alphabetical order with a lot of repetition in the prefixes of the term in order to save space in there. So now you have even less bytes in there and you can still combine that with the optimization of skipping pointers, right? So you can do either or, and you can also do both. All right, okay. So we have four uh, optimizations right there. How did we do? If we now experiment, this is something that you will also find in the book. Okay, so fixed width. Uh, the dictionary side, that's the, with, with the super wasting, uh, you know, storage wasting technique with 20 bytes per word, 11 megabytes roughly, 11.2 megabytes. Unique strings and pointers, you know, with the pointers for every term, down to seven megabytes. That's better, right? 
blocking, if I take k equals four, for example, then I'm down to 7.1. It's cumulative, right? I keep adding optimization. And then on top of that, I add front coding, and now I'm down to 5.9 megabytes. That was the original size of my collection, right? So 960 megabytes, that's the original collection. And this is just the size of the dictionary, meaning the part on the left uh, on the, uh, where, yeah, that part right there, right? So this yellow part right there is the size that you see right there. So it's pretty good, right? Uh, we were at 11.2 uh, with the naive approach and now we are down to 5.9. So it's almost, a, it's, it's a, almost a factor of two, right? So that, that's not so bad. And if you add it to the, the other optimizations we saw before, uh, that, that's, uh, that's pretty good, all right? Okay, so that's it. We've compressed this and now you know a few techniques uh, that you can, it's like a restaurant menu, right? If you want to go ahead and implement the system, you can just go shopping. You can say, okay, I'm going to use this optimization. I'm going to use that optimization. But this other optimization maybe doesn't make sense for me uh, because I have this and this use case that, uh, that uh, doesn't justify it, right? So you can now shop for the optimizations and pick the ones, cherry pick the ones that you want to use. All right, so this is done. We squeezed it in half, right? Plus the 33% that we even squeezed from before. So it's minus 33% and again, uh, uh, half of that. So if you combine even with stop words and numbers and so on, we are even at 16%. That, that's pretty, pretty good. All right. Okay. So this is, this, is, uh, this is it. Okay. We are done. Now let's go to that part. It's actually even more exciting. Actually, that's my, that's my favorite part. So let's try to go ahead and compress the postings then. Shall we? So what is it we are really compressing right there? What are these postings? Well, we saw that the postings are pairs of terms and documents. More precisely, it's a term and it's a document ID. But we saw that even though it's a pair on the same line here, it's always the same term. So the terms we do not repeat when we are done building the index. Maybe we repeat them while constructing the index, as we said, but when it's done, we just put the terms once. And then all we put here is the, uh, are the document IDs. What are the document IDs? Well, in practice, it's going to be integers. That's document one, that's document two, that's document three, and you just increase your integers and that's it, right? So in practice, what we want to do is compress lists of integers. And now, why is that wonderful? Because compressing a list of integers has now become a mathematical problem. So now we can even completely forget that we are in an information retrieval lecture. We can completely forget that we are indexing collections. We just want to squeeze lists of integers. That's all we want to do. So let's turn into mathematicians and, and, and try to squeeze lists of integers into as few bits uh, as we can. Mathematicians or computer scientists, because there's a bit of information theory um, in, uh, in there. All right. OK, so I'm going to start exactly like we did before with the dictionary. I'm going to start with a standard approach. Right. So the standard approach was, you know, very naive. I have a constant number of bytes for every uh, term back then. So, okay, let's have a constant number of bytes for every document ID. Um, four bytes. Why four? Well, again, four bytes, what is that? That's 32 bits, four billion. So with this, I can index four billion documents. Four billion documents, that's not so bad, right? So if you're the Library of Congress or the British Museum, then probably that's fine with you. Uh, okay, if you're Google and you want to index the internet, it will not work because there's probably more than 4 billion web pages, right? But let me just assume right now that we don't have more than 4 billion uh, documents. And so it means that four bytes uh, are enough for the entire family. All right. So uh, this, uh, yeah, well, you're computer scientist, so I don't think I have to emphasize on that. And that is, well, if you even compute the precise number, it's 4 billion and 200 million more, right? But what are 200 million compared to 4 billion? But anyway, any uh, document ID between this and that. Um, well, as you can imagine here, the computation is quite easy. It's four bytes times the number of documents, right? In the worst case that you have 4 billion documents, you basically need 16 billion bytes. So that's roughly uh, 16 gigabytes, if I'm correct. So you're going to need 16 gigabytes just for a list of integers, right? Uh, okay, can we do better? And again, as you can assume, because there's an entire lecture on that, yes, we can do better, obviously, right? And we are going to do better. We are going to encode 
this taking less space than four bytes for each uh, post -it document ID. Okay, so there's going to be a lot of ideas in there. Here's the first idea. How is this list of postings? Is it any list of integers or does it have any property that we can use? What, what, what properties does this list have of document IDs? From the chat, uh, it's increasing. Yes, absolutely. It's an increasing list. Any ideas how we can then compress a bit in there? It's increasing. Do we need to store every document ID? Uh, have the first uh, ID and then the differences. Yeah, absolutely. So here, if you encode every number, right, that's a lot of bits. But here, indeed, that's exactly your ID. These are small gaps because this is an increasing list. Let, let me take a, a, almost a stop well, like a, a term that is very frequent. Then the gaps here are actually rather small if you have a frequent term. So what's going to happen is that the, the gaps in between, the differences, are actually smaller numbers than the, uh, than the actual document IDs. So then your idea, which is excellent, is to say, let's store the first one. But then instead of storing this, I'm just going to store two. Then I'm going to store five. Then I'm going to store one. And then I'm going to store three. And then, of course, you can reconstruct the document IDs. But probably your intuition tells you it probably can take less space to store two than it takes space to store 1,058. It probably takes less space to store five than it takes to store 1,063. It probably takes less space to store one than it's uh, to, to, to store 1,064, right? So what we have done right here is basically a bijection between a sorted list of integers and an unsorted list of integers. Because this here, if you only take a look at them, then there's no order anymore. That, that can be anything. The gaps can be anything. So we map the sorted list of integers to an unsorted list of integers. That's the first thing we do. And this unsorted list will, of course, be smaller. The integers will be smaller than the original list. OK, so we can encode the gaps uh, like this. So we can maybe on four bytes, we still encode the first document ID. And then we intuitively, right? I'm using my intuition right now, because probably you're already objecting in your, in your mind. Let's see how you, if you object to this. But, let me see, okay, that's a small number. Maybe four bits are enough for that. We don't need 32, right? So let's use four bits in there, four bits in there, four bits in there, four bits in there. And there you go, we've squeezed the whole thing because now instead of having 32 bits every time, I have four bits every time. Okay, that's a great idea, right? That's a factor of eight. <laughs> so that, that's a great way of squeezing. Um, do you agree with that? Do you see any objection to that? Do you see any problem with that? the gaps might be bigger than just one byte. Yeah, absolutely. Because here, I actually picked a list that has a lot of very close document IDs, right? So that's probably a term that occurs very frequently. But what if I take uh, a very rare term, right? So, so something that you, that, 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 that you very rarely see. Um, I think sexquipedalian, for example, to take that term out, out of poetry, right? So, Probably in there, it's going to be here and it's going to be there and that's pretty much it. But maybe that's going to be a document ID 1,000 and document ID 2 million, right? But then the gap, of course, is no longer that small integer. It's, it's a huge gap, right? So that actually works if you want a, a constant number of bits for the very frequent terms, but this has an assumption of the, on the gaps. And since you want here to take a constant number, because right now we are dealing with constant numbers of, of constant encodings for the integers, we need to take the max of everything we can have. But what is the max? Well, it's again four bytes. So we basically gain nothing, right? Because we need to take four bytes and again four bytes and four bytes and four bytes and four bytes, right? Just because the gaps could be large. So it looks like at first sight that maybe this was a bad idea. Maybe after all, we don't have anything to gain from the gaps, right? But why do we assume it's a bad idea? It's because we have this constant length, right? What if we did not have this constant length? What is we were indeed able to store the smaller integers more efficiently and then the larger integers maybe a bit less efficiently. 
what if we can find some elasticity in there that 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 we dynamically store uh, the the integers right so uh, it only works for frequent terms we do have a variable gap size and thus if we want this idea with the gaps to work then we need to come up with a variable byte encoding and no longer a constant byte encoding all right so let's try to find variable byte encodings then how can we encode integers in a way that automatically adapts right magically if it's a small integer it takes less bits and if, if it's a large integer then it's going to take more bits right so let's start looking in variable byte encodings okay so what's the problem with a variable byte encoding well, if we have a fixed length encoding, we know where it stops. Because if we know that this, the first document ID takes 32 bits and the second one 32 bits and the third one 32 bits and so on, we know very easily where the boundaries are, right? I know that it stops here after four bytes. I know that the next document ID stops here. I know that the next document ID stops here. Um, in fact, this is used by database people a lot because if you have uh, relational databases, and the storage of every column is a constant number of bits, then it means that every record, every row in your relational database has a fixed number of bits as well. What does it mean? It means that if you want to access record number 1 billion, for example, so the millionth row in your table, all you need to do is do a simple multiplication of 1 million times the size of the record and you can do a single jump directly to the place where the record is. That's the magic of fixed size records. You can do that sort of things, right? Uh, but of course, it only works with fixed size records. So this is the luxury that we had when we had these fixed size records that took a lot of space. OK, so it means concretely, because all you see on the disk is a series of zeros and ones, right? But you know, you compute every time 32, 32, 32. So you read 32, you put a boundary, then you count 32, you put a boundary, and so on. So you know exactly where it stops. The problem with variable length encodings is that you don't know <laughs> because the, 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 the length can vary. You don't know for sure it's going to be four bytes. Maybe it's two, maybe it's three, maybe it's 16. We don't know. So we need to do something about it, right? Here we don't, we know it's X bits, but how do I know? Maybe it stops here, maybe it stops there, maybe it stops there, I have no idea. And of course I need to know, I need to store somewhere in such a way that I know. Um, and the idea is that you need to find the code in such a way that looking at it or you know, starting reading it gives you a reasoning that tells you, okay, this is where it stops, right? I, I know that if I start reading here, I stop exactly here. Uh, and that gives me uh, x bits. X can vary, but I can deduce from looking at here where x is. Turns out there is a name for that, and that's called the prefix code. So what is a prefix code? If you express it a bit mathematically, it's basically a code such that there are no two strings according to that code, two strings of bits or you know whatever, strings or whatever. You never have one valid string that is a prefix or another valid string. Right. So it basically means you never have the encoding of an integer that is the prefix of an encoding of another integer. If you take it conversely, what, what if you did have an int two integers that start with the same prefix, but then it means you have an ambiguity on where it stops because you don't need if you're supposed to stop here and that's the first integer or if you're going to stop there and that's the second one. But if you have a prefix code and you know that there will never ever be two integers, one as an encoding that is the prefix or another, then that will not happen. It turns out that there's a great way to actually understand that because we have that in real life with phone numbers. You might not have known it, but the entire phone number system worldwide in any country is a prefix code. And the, 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 the way you notice is that uh, if you still have phones like that, I, I know that maybe mobile phones don't do that, but if you use, let's say, an internal ETH phone or whatever, like uh, a cord phone, uh, and you pick it up, then you 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 hear that sound, right? Dun! So you 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 hear the, the 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 sound. By the way, the sound was put there because people otherwise were surprised that it doesn't do any sound. So they have to come up with a sound that kind of say, okay, yes, I'm listening. You can, you can type your number, right? So this is where that sound comes from. So there is this sound that, as soon as you pick up, starts playing, 
uh, it used to be an, uh, the, the, the music note A actually, 440 Hertz, even though it can vary a bit. It switched actually to G sharp for the, uh, for the mobile phones at some point. And now I think it's pretty much uh, a bit of a mess with all kinds of notes, but originally it was an A. So you have this note that plays, and then you start entering the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the number on your, uh, uh, on your phone. So the way it works is that you, you, you push the number and that actually produces two notes. One takes, uh, gives you the row coordinate of the key and the other one, the uh, colon coordinate of the key. So that's, that's a variable frequency uh, encoding. And so instantly, if you, type, if you start uh, typing on your phone, uh, then the sound stops that you hear in your, it immediately stops because it, it passed kind of the, the, that, that you press the key. What's important is that it's not the actual key that send the signal. It's the two music notes coming from the key that, that go to the other side and say, okay, key one was pressed or key zero. But then you might have noticed that if you, if you start composing a number, okay, so, so that's the, the standard of ETH. Uh, we are not going to call it. We don't want to disturb them, right? But if you start pressing on your keyboard, zero, four, four, six, three, two, and stop there, then you notice that nothing's gonna happen. It's like the system is waiting for you. So, it means the system knows that you're not done. How does it know that you're not done? Well, it's precisely because the phone number is a, is a prefix code, the phone number system. So as soon as you have uh, entered all of these numbers and stopped here, uh, then it will start actually um, dialing the number, right? But it's really waiting until the end. So you might have thought, okay, well, all phone numbers have 10 digits, so that's easy, right? But no, not all phone numbers have 10 digits because for example, emergency numbers have three digits and you have international numbers. So that's one in California, in the US, as you see with 650, uh, it's longer, right? So in fact, phone numbers already give us a solution for what we want because for, phone numbers are in fact a variable length encoding of, of somebody you want to call. And at the same time, they are a prefix code because when you start dialing, there is no ambiguity about when it stops, right? And you even see that with the internal systems that the emergency has ETH is 888 and the internal numbers have five digits, not starting with a zero. And this is why you need to add a zero when you want to leave your company or leave ETH. Well, the reason for this zero that you need to add is because we want a prefix code system, right? So now you know the, the, the phone number system is a prefix code system for exactly that reason. And if as an exercise, I give you a sequence of phone numbers just like that without telling you the boundaries, you will be able to deduce the boundaries because the system is designed in that way. You see 001, okay, that's the US. So there will be the three digits of the area code and then seven more digits uh, to, to point to where I am, right? And then uh, uh, um, that stops here. Then you have, okay, one, one. So that's an emergency number stops right there. And then you have zero, four, four, okay, that's Zurich. Then you know there's 10 digits. So you see how it works, right? You can actually reconstitute the, uh, the numbers. Well, it turns out that that's exactly what we want. It's exactly the sort of things that we would like to encode uh, the, uh, the gaps because we would like the, uh, the, the length of the gaps to vary a bit. Um, another example of prefix code that we can get inspiration for, because of course, we are not going to do actual phone numbers for the, for the, for the postings, of course. That, that may be a bit too complex for what we need. But another example of prefix code that we can still look into is the character encoding UTF-8, because that teaches us maybe a methodology we can use in order to encode our postings. So how does UTF-8 work? Well, we have the Unicode encoding, sorry, I didn't say encoding, the Unicode catalog, the Unicode catalog that is a list of all the characters, letters, and with accent and so on, and even the latest emojis that, uh, that you will find in there. So it's just a mapping from an integer to some symbol. How do we encode them? Well, it turns out that UTF-8 is a prefix code and it's even a variable length prefix code. How does that work? Well, if the character is simple enough, mean it's ASCII or very uh, small characters, so it, it takes at most seven bits here. What we do is that we encode it in eight bits, right? So the seven bits uh, that, 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 that constitute the integer we put in there and we put a zero in front. What does the zero tell us? Well, the zero tell us, uh, tells us that's all there is. So if you see something starting with a zero, then you, need, there's, you know there's only eight bits and that's it. So you know that if there's a zero, you need to look at the next seven bits and then you can decode and see it's the letter P. What happens if I have more than seven bits, but less than 11, right? At most 11, less than 12 at most 11. So let's take the number, the, the, not the number, it's a number of course, but here I mean the character pi. Um, 
so it corresponds to this in uh, if in base 16 right and if you enter it in base 2 then it's this sequence of 11 bits how do we encode this well we are not going of course to fit that in 8 bits we are going to fit it on 16 bits how do we do that well first we need to use a one obviously because zero would have told us that's all there is so you you need the one what happens is that we put it in two halves one half here with uh, here I have uh, five of them and here the other half with six, right? Six plus five gives us 11. So what happens is we put this one, one, zero followed by the first five bits and then one zero here followed by the remaining six bits, all right? So imagine you're dialing that over a phone. It's basically one, one, zero. Okay, I know it's going to be six, 16 bits, right? It's exactly the same thing like, oh, I know it's America. I know there's that many digits. I know it's Switzerland and so on. Okay, so 110 tells us there are two packets and 10 is called, the, uh, the, it's basically a flag that tells us it's the continuation of, of a previously started sequence, right? So 10 is the continuation of that. It will make even more sense if I continue with higher bits, then you will understand immediately how that works. Let me take, of course, the more recent they are, the higher they are in the Unicode catalog, right? Because you keep adding to, uh, to the newer numbers. So this is the Euro sign encoded like this in base 16. And this one has less than 16 bits. How do we do it? On three bytes, three sequences of eight bits. How do I do it? Well, now in my first packet, I put 1110. And this 1110 tells me there are three packets. So as soon as I've looked at this 1110, I know there are going to be uh, 24 bits. And that's it. And then you see this one zero that says, okay, that's a continuation flag. And here that's a continuation flag and so on, right? And, and this is how it generalizes, right? So you can go also higher with four packets with one, 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 zero, and so on and so on. Are there any questions so far? Yes, I wanted that question. Okay, okay, go ahead, uh, go ahead, Dan. We, I see yeah, the, the so question. Are the one zeros not redundant? Yes, that's exactly what I wanted you to ask. Perfect. All right. So indeed, if we want to inspire ourselves, we also need to get rid of uh, useless stuff, right? So indeed, you might think, okay, but if I read one 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 zero here and I know there are twenty four bits, then why don't I also use these bits to encode stuff, right? Then instead of sixteen, I can put twenty bits in there, right? So it it looks like a waste of space in there to add this one zero and this one zero. So we we could do even better. Well, it turns out that this is because there's yet another property that UTF eight has and that we actually do not need for information retrieval. But the property has to do that if you open a text document, let's say you do some archeology span and you retrieve the tablet with the bit encodings, but you don't have the beginning and you don't have the end and you don't really, you don't have the, you know, you don't know where it starts. And you just jump right in the middle of your sequence of, of, of bits. You, you, you know the boundaries of the bytes when, the, when each byte starts, but you don't know where you are in your text documents. Well, this code has the property that is kind of self-synchronizing in the sense that if you jump right in the middle of a text document that is incomplete and you see uh, one zero in there, then you immediately know, okay, well, that, that's not the start of something new, that's a continuation packet. And then all you need to do is go either left or right and looks for the next packet that doesn't have one and zero. And then you know that's a starting sequence. And then you can start parsing from there and then start scanning the documents. It means you can open the document even if you're missing the beginning of the document, right? That's the self-synchronization. That's why you have the one zero here. That's what it's for. But for posting this, we are not doing archeology. span So we are going to assume we don't have that problem of you know, not doing the beginning. So we are going to drop that part, right? Of, of the one zero, we, 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 we don't really need it. We are just going to be using a, a different way. And the way, we are going to do it is like this. Let's assume eight bit packets because that's a parameter we can change. So eight bit packets. What's gonna happen is that I'm only going to, to be using one bit right there, just one, that's my continuation bit. And then I'm going to encode my things on the remaining seven bits every time, right? I, I don't have this uh, one, 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 zero, blah, blah, blah. So every time I have a continuation bit, it's either one or zero. It basically tells me that's a new integer that the code, that's the continuation of the, of the previous one. Uh, so let's do it. Okay. Uh, let's take the number four. 
in base two, the number four is one zero zero, right? So let's put a few more zeros in front to make it seven bits. Now I have seven bits, so I encode my seven bits like that, the number four. And in front, I put a one, and the one tells me, okay, it ends here. Right? So th this, this is why it ends. If I see a one, then I know that's all there is. And let's encode now this other one, but you probably guess what's going to happen right now. So we have 270. So maybe you're not going to be as fast as for four, of course, to compute what it is in base two, but you're going to have to trust me, right? So uh, I, I think I probably used an, an automatic calculator for that. I can't remember. Well, maybe with 256, not so far away, you can actually do it in your head. But anyway, one, zero, 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 one, 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 zero. Okay. So I need to put it on a multiple of seven now. So I am going to add a few zeros right there, and then I have my seven bits here, my seven bits there. So what's going to happen now is that I have now in base two the number added with zeros to make it a multiple of seven. And then I'm adding a zero right there that basically says this is not where it ends, and a one there that says this is where it ends. Right. So now I have zero, zero, zero. Okay, I, I, I know I continue to read because of that. And then I see a one. Okay, now these are the last eight, and I stop here. How do you decode? Well, you just remove these two guys here, and then you have your original bits. All right, and so on and so forth. This is how it works. Now, if I have encoded an enormous number because I'm trying to download the entire internet and index it, then what I need to do is just put uh, all my bits right there in packets of sevens and pad with a few zeros right there. I add zeros on all the packets that are not the same one, the, the last one. And the last one, I put a one right there. And that tells me where it ends. So you see that it's less, it's less wasteful than, uh, than um, UTF-8. Uh, it also doesn't have the problem of UTF-8 that, you know, if you have this 1110 scheme, it doesn't scale beyond a certain number of packets because at some point you have, let's say you have a, a six, okay, so 1111110, that tells you there are six packets, but then you only have one single bit left uh, to encode. So you see, you, you cannot scale it beyond six packets. Um, but here, if we use this scheme right there with just one bit here, you see that there, there is no limit to the, to the way it scales. I can encode uh, a Google if I want. I can encode absolutely huge numbers just because I can put as many zeros as I want to make it not end. And then I put a one when I want it to end. Okay? So this is called the variable byte encoding. And I'm going to stop here because I think there was the bell, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. Was so we're going to stop here uh, and I'll see you uh, at 15 past three. Uh, for the continuation. I'll show you something even better than that, but let's stop here with that. Thank you very much and uh, see you in uh, 15 minutes.